Good evening. It is the 15th of September 2021. I'm going to read the second chapter of this book. I'll only give a brief introduction about the author and the reason for the book. It's a biography by Angela. Angela Canning worked as a secretary for the Hampshire Fire Service in her hometown of Winchester and married Arthur, a senior fire officer. When they moved to Newbury, they became friends with Louise and Yvonne Vaness, who taught them how to run their wildlife hospital for them when they went on holiday. Louise asked Angela if one day she would write their life story, which she did, and Angela will donate all the royalties to a wildlife hospital, a charity, as not chosen as yet because the book's only just been produced. I sat with Angela throughout COVID and I never in church and I never knew any of this and it's just wonderful. So those who've heard chapter one, it's out there for those who haven't heard it. So I'm now going to proceed with chapter two. I gave it rather a long introduction. I'm not going to bore you with that now. I'll write everything you need to know on the uh, about the video chapter 2 1964 and the title wise owl and barn owl is a true life story church house where we lived was a solid victorian building adjoining the parish rooms with a sizable garden at the front suitable for our wildlife and it lay along a narrow passage leading down to the canal. On the opposite side stood the church, dedicated to St Nicholas, of which I had become the verger, and with its fine perpendicular tower, surmounted by pinnacles, dominated the canal and the lock. Newbury held a cattle and general market on Thursdays, and on those days, the streets swarmed with country folk coming in to buy and sell their wares. We were surprised by the doorbell ringing one such morning to find an elderly man from Aldermaston clutching something which he had brought in in his bicycle basket. Her terrible squealing at me fruit cage, he explained, and found he caught up in the netting. It was a male hedgehog in a pathetic state and I donned some gloves and took it from him. The netting had entwined itself so tightly round his entire body that it was enough to sever his tiny head and legs. It is nothing for a hedgehog to become caught up in netting or string left around by careless people. It required two pairs of hands to deal with it and Yvonne and I began by snipping the netting round his neck. But once he's free, Prickles rolled himself into a tight ball, wrapping his paws round his face. Oh, we tried tempting him with pieces of meat held in the direction of his nose, but he refused to be coaxed. The little fellow had probably spent several hours in his predicament overnight, and was in a severe state of shock. We achieved little by little, with endless patience, snipping each square to remove the cords tightly bound round his legs. They were cut to the bone, and we applied Acriflex to heal them, an ointment that is harmless to wildlife if licked. It was then a tricky business to hold them open while we freed his front and even his tiny underparts. Then at last, we were able to lift the netting from his coat. Within a trice, he had rolled himself into a tight ball again, and there was nothing for it but to let him sleep off his shock in a warm box in a cupboard. The job had taken us an entire hour. On the north side of the church, Kennet was diverted to form a waterfall 
to work the town flour mill and both sides were a haven for myriads of waterfowl. It was nearing the end of the summer. Swans glided gracefully with their cygnets, now a sludgy white and growing larger week by week, while mallards appended moorhens and coots dabbled in the reeds and tiny dub chicks, or lesser grebs, dived under water. It was a scene of peace. Yet for all that, we were beginning to learn that the Kennet was also a hazardous place for unsuspecting wildlife. Careless anglers would leave their tackle behind. And a boy came to us one afternoon in a flurried state. A swan by the bridge has a fishing hook lodged in its throat. I followed him along the towpath to the spot where it was, and my heart missed a beat. It was a signet, still with its parents. Swans, with their mighty wing joints and heavy bones, are capable of drowning a man. And I was aware that the situation was precarious, to say the least. A male swan, when fighting, will seize its opponent by the back of the neck. This hold will cause its attacker to collapse. And this is what I had to do now. Summoning all my courage, I managed to lure the distressed creature to the bank and with one dart grabbed its neck and pulled it out of the river to the accompaniment of this fish, vicious hiss, hissings and imminent attack of the parent birds. Then as swiftly as I dared, I eased the cook out and returned their offspring to them. Sweet success. Suddenly loud cheers echoed from all directions around me and I looked up. An appreciative audience had gathered on the opposite bank and on the bridge to watch. It was a repetition of the old familiar ring of the nightclub days. But this time, hopefully, there would be no encore. The canal was a pleasant place for a stroll in the evening and we made it our regular exercise. It was there that we first met Fluffy, the miller's black, big black cat, lurking for mice. Fluffy consistently rubbed himself round our legs, enjoying the fuss. He would walk with us as far as the two quaint weavers' cottages for Newbury, had once been a rich woollen town, and every citizen had made a living off the sheep's back. At that point, Fluffy would come no further, and we would cross the iron bridge to wander back towards the lock. On the opposite side stood another tall, old flour mill, but now disused, and between that and the lock keeper's cottage was a piece of waste ground containing some stables and a peacock wandering around amongst the overground vegetation. One evening in late October, a heap of empty fish boxes had also arrived at the scene. Strange horses living on fish, we remarked, and our curiosity got the better of us. We climbed over the fence and took an unauthorised peep inside the stables. Ugh, a hundred or more ferret-like creatures stared at us from individual cages, their glossy dark fur tinged with blue. A mink farm, Yvonne announced without hesitation and feeling sickened, we departed on our way. From the lock keeper's cottage came the sound of hammering, and we guessed he was busy repairing his rowing boats, which he hired out on the wharf. John Gould even owned the two motor launches, Kelston and Limply Stoke, which sailed up and down the canal, 
taking the public on joy rides. At the sound of our approach, Buffer, his Jack Russell, came running out to meet us with a serious series of woofs. His master stopped his work and came out also, ever eager for someone to chat to. A unique man, tall and thin, with a thirst for open life air. He was always a mine of information and we commented on the quantity of fish for the mink. Oh yeah, they're blue mink. Mink was introduced into this country from America in about 1929, you know. Their natural habitat is riverbanks and fens, so that's why their food is mainly fish. Although their eyesight underwater is poor, in the wild they also kill poultry, if they have a mind to, and even rabbits. As he continued talking, a team of bell ringers suddenly commenced their weekly practice and the great stone edifice of St Nicholas standing opposite us in the sunset, sunset sprang to life. I often think what a fine church that is. Have you heard of Jack O'Newbury? He built it. His real name was John Wincombe, the richest wool merchant we ever had even entertained the king and all his court at his house up the road. Still there now. Which king? Henry VIII. Jack felt the old church wasn't large enough, so he pulled it down and paid to have this one built. Can't imagine that today, can you? The churchyard was far larger in past centuries, of course, even extended to the south. Wait a moment we interrupted. That is where church house is now. We must be living amongst the dead. He threw back his head and gave a roar of laughter. They won't rise up after all these years. He returned to his work, chuckling to himself and called. Although they might do tonight, it's Halloween. Late in the night, an eerie sound awoke us from our sleep. It wasn't spirits, but a ring of the front doorbell. We seized our dressing gowns, went downstairs, and a young couple called, who oh, we've bought a barn owl with a broken wing. We unlocked the door and took the patient from them. It was a beautiful bird. Its dark brown eyes glimmering from a heart-shaped face, its white underparts and face glowing a ghostly white. It was obvious why some folk call them the White Owl. We thanked them and put Barney to bed, but as soon as daylight dawned, we knew we would have to mend that wing before it became set. We needed advice and telephoned Peter Scott at Slimbridge. His reply was that he did not look after injured birds who were to turn. Who were we to turn to? There was no one. We had to teach ourselves. And so we did, by trial and error. It was broken between the shoulder and the elbow. And being a large species of bird, we guessed it would take eight to twelve weeks to mend. We held the wing in its natural flight position and taking a lolly stick, sliced it lengthways down the centre to make two splints. Then we applied one to the top side of the wing and the other parallel to it to the underside. In those days, Micropore had not been invented, but we bound them round with a reel of thin elastoplast, half an inch wide, taking care not to splint the wing at the elbow itself, for it would have restricted its flight. We realised that any splint must only reach as far as the bend. Next, we mended his individual feathers, 
firstly by separating the barbs and then binding them again with elastoplast firmly round each shaft. Then smooth the barbs back to their natural position. It seemed to work and day by day Barney's confidence began to return. But getting him to eat was a different matter. When we left his meat diced in a row along his perch he always left it untouched. We tried force feeding him but just as we thought he had digested it each time he regurgitated it all and we were back to square one. We began to learn lesson one. It is impossible to force feed a barn owl. His natural diet would have been voles and mice covered in fur. And we had an idea. We decided to go to the butchers to acquire a rabbit skin. Then we cut it up, rolled it carefully around each piece of stewing steak and left it on his perch. It did the trick. Next morning, his food was gone. We continued to perform this ritual methodically every night. But alas, the next week there was a crisis. No rabbits had been bought in this week. The butcher told us, attired in his striped apron, I'm sorry. Once more we were in despair. Barry, Barney refused to eat again. In the evening, we took our usual stroll along the canal. Fluffy, the miller's cat, prowling outside, ran towards us, rubbing himself round our legs in the usual greeting. You're molting, Fluffy, we said, as countless hairs were distributed over our slap, slacks. Fluffy, you're the answer, I exclaimed suddenly. Allow me a handful of your beautiful fur. I pulled it out gently and took it back home. Then wrapping each piece of meat in the black ball of fluff, we left it along Barney's perch. In the morning, Fluffy's fur lay tossed on the ground, but the meat had gone. That is the end of chapter two. God bless you all and thank you for listening. That was a lot shorter than last night, wasn't it? So I suppose I'd better tell you what the ISBN number is. 9781788309660. Author Angela Canning, price 899. And it's all going to the charity whenever that charity is chosen it's uh, only just come out this book so I, I don't suppose I don't know where you'll get one from but the Olympia publishers I'll write it on the blurb God bless and I'll be reading chapter three later maybe not today I'm not sure when maybe who knows God bless